Welcome everyone. My name is Roger Fisk. I'm the executive director of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Uh, this is my colleague Octavio Carranza next to me, our director of ship operations. We are coming to you live from Mexico City. We have so much uh, news to share with everyone. But uh, first, I want to welcome everyone who supported us throughout the years. Uh, sea Shepherd is an entirely donation-driven conservation organization. And what we do is we, we put our ships and our captains and our crews out on the sea, out on oceans, helping endangered marine wildlife, either rescuing them from illegal uh, fishing gear, uh, getting in, in the way of, uh, of, of uh, endangered marine wildlife and, and poachers and cartels and going to places that many many other NGOs will not go. And we can only do it because we're supported by viewers like you. So thank you so much. Um, here in Mexico City, uh, one year ago, we debuted our ship, the Seahorse, and we're gonna be talking to the captain of, of that ship. But so much has happened in the last year. Uh, in 2023, we saw a 90% reduction in the illegal fishing that's conducted in Vaquita Refuge's uh, zero tolerance area, which is where the, the world's most endangered marine mammal is down to just about a dozen uh, members of, of its species, the Vaquita porpoise. One of our campaigns, Operation Milagro, is out there in a partnership with the government of Mexico to protect these remaining porpoise. And right now we're in the middle of expanding that operation to uh, take on more territory, more responsibility, uh, with a new species so we now as of this month january of 2024 we're also responsible for the totawaba which is an at-risk species that's also illegally fished so we're super excited about the work that we're doing in that campaign in the, just the last few months some of you heard from me when i was in brussels at the european union parliament putting together our 2024 strategy around the stop the Grind uh, campaign which we are partnered with uh with uh, sea shepherd global which is the effort to bring about an end uh, to the barbaric slaughter of pilot whales and bottlenose dolphins in the Faroe Islands just north of Scotland. And just Monday of this week, we announced another partnership with Sea Shepherd Global where we're um, bringing uh, the Sea Shepherd boat Alan Kay into Antarctica to uh, bring the world's attention to the devastation that industrial trawlers are bringing to the krill fishery of Antarctica, which is an absolutely vital source of food for the world's whales. And we're gonna be shining a bright light on that. We're gonna be mustering up diplomatic and political pressure so that we can protect that area and protect those whales. And that's what we do here at Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. And that's what our donors and our supporters fund. So thank you so much for joining us here tonight. We're gonna to go and actually visit uh, some of our ships um, and the one we're going to go to is uh, the Martin Sheen. So we're going to bring in Captain Cass of the Martin Sheen. So many of you who have supported us for a long time know that the Martin Sheen has uh, been in the fleet for quite some time. Octavio's earliest campaigns were on the Martin Sheen. We're joined by the captain now. So Captain Cass, thank you so much for joining the debut 2024 Sea Shepherd show. Uh, how are things going on the Martin Sheen? Hey Roger, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been uh, it's been an epic experience coming down here. Um, things on the Martin Sheen are going really, really well. We've had some time. Um, we've been affected by weather, so we we're locked in in La Paz at the moment. So that gives us a bit of time to really prepare for the campaign and make sure that when we do arrive there, we're fully prepared and ready to go. Excellent. Let's let's take a step back and just understand a little bit about you. Here you are, you're the captain of one of our ships and things like that. But when did you first kind of fall in love with the ocean and what set you on your on a on a career trajectory such that you're captaining one of the Sea Shepherd ships? Sure. Well, growing up in Cape Town, South Africa, you know, I grew up at the beach, you know, I've got pictures of me surfing when I was a little five-year-old kid with my dad. Um, so the beach and the sea, the ocean has always kind of been a part of me and who I am um been venturing into scuba diving and free diving uh, as soon as i left school so so developed a deep love and passion for the ocean at quite an early age um yeah then moving on to boats and sailing and and actually exploring the oceans and and looking further afield um naturally being out there you you bear witness to to the wildlife and the elements that are out there and it's i mean for me it was almost impossible not to fall hopelessly in love with it 
Awesome. And we use terms like captain and first mate and things like that, but maybe you could actually just take a second and share with our viewers, what, what does being a captain mean, setting aside like what we hear about movies and everything else, but what's what's a day like uh, a day in, uh, of work like for you as, as captain of the Martin Sheen? Sure. Well, I mean, in my opinion, uh, being a captain of a sailing boat is the best job in the world. It's uh, it, it changes. It varies depending on what we're up to. If we're at sea, if we're on passage, uh, my roles and duties will vary quite differently to like in this situation now where we're in the marina. But it's a lot of uh, a lot of organization, a lot of foresight, a lot of planning on what's going to come. Um, dealing with the crew, making sure that all the crew are well fed, well slept, you know, hydrated, all of that kind of thing is quite a big part of it as well. Um, and then just learning to understand your vessel and your surroundings, you know, the area that you're navigating um, and the vessel that you're on. It's uh, it's super important to develop a really, a really deep relationship with the vessel where you uh, you can hear one sound in the middle of the night and you know exactly where it's coming from and what that what it is and what needs to change in order to make it stop, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, sort of getting, like I said, getting to know the vessel and the crew um, and the area that you're in um, is a massive part of it um but yeah pretty much that's it and maybe just take also a second to share with our viewers you're on your way to the upper gulf of california and maybe you could share a little bit about what is the martin sheen going to do when you get there how long is it going to take you to get there things like that nice um so yeah we came down from ensenada on the on the west coast of mexico uh it took us about a week to get here uh, we had really nice downwind conditions the whole way. It was a, it was a pretty beautiful passage. Um, coming up into the bay, we uh, this time of year we 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 bear witness to quite a lot of the northerly winds, which makes it quite difficult for us to sail up. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be a bumpy passage getting up there. But uh, we're really looking forward to getting there. And obviously, once we arrive, that's when that's when the work starts. You know, that's why we're here. This is what we're here to do. Um, so there's the the exclusion zone up there, which is uh, a protected area that's looking after the vaquita, um, and we're going to be up there, sort of patrolling and just making sure that 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 area is being respected by the local fishermen and that they aren't encroaching in that trawling nets through that area and uh, putting this this beautiful mammal in in danger. Um, obviously, we have the most endangered mammal on the planet right now that's uh, that's crying out for our help. So, um, yeah, once we're up there, we're going to be doing everything possible with all available resources to ensure that uh, we give that animal the best possible chance to recover. Beautiful. Captain Cass, thank you so much. And this is a natural segue for um, going over to the seahorse now. So that's Captain Cass from uh, uh, the Sea Shepherd vessel, uh, the Martin Sheen. They're on their way to the <coughs> upper Gulf of California. And when Captain Cass and the Martin Sheen get there, they're going to be partnering with Captain Alejandro, who joins us now. He's on uh, our, our vessel, the Seahorse, which is really kind of like the center of gravity of Operation Milagro. It's plunked right down in the middle of the, of the zero tolerance zone so that we can maintain surveillance across the entire uh, zero tolerance area and, and protect these vaquitas. So, Captain Cass, thank you so much for joining us. And That's Captain up, Alejandro... Thank you so much for joining the Sea Shepherd. So, uh, Captain Alejandro, how are things going on the Seahorse? Hello, my name is Alejandro. I'm the captain of the Seahorse. Yeah, everything is going uh, perfect over here. Like, we haven't seen any fishing activity inside the CTA. Uh, the Navy is supporting us a lot for making sure that the CTA is free of any illegal fishing. So, everything is going great over here. Fantastic. And, and Alejandro, maybe you could share just a little bit with our viewers. How long have you been involved in, in Sea Shepherd and what are some of the other jobs that you've had on some other boats and things like that? Well, I have been here in Sea Shepherd for two years. And before here, I used to be in an old tanker and a tugboat. But right now I'm focusing 100% in Sea Shepherd because I think it's, the, it's an amazing campaign. Like we're supporting wildlife and especially the vaquita, which is an endemic species here in Mexico, which is my country of origin. So, yeah, uh, I've been here for two years and I'm very excited for being part of this campaign and also to be the captain of this vessel, making sure that the fishing, illegal fishing is not allowed here in the, the CTA and we're protecting the, the Vaquira Marina. Yeah. That's fantastic. And thank you so much for doing that, too. You're on the bridge now. Maybe you could tell us just a little bit about the role uh, that the bridge plays so on the ship so and some of the equipment that's around you. Sorry, can you repeat the question? 
Of course. And I know I realize you're in the middle of having a job to do too. Yeah. I, I believe that you're on the bridge. So maybe you could just tell a little, uh, tell us a little bit about what the bridge is what, and the role that it plays on the ship and, and why the captain is, is uh, often uh, there on, on duty. Yeah, so our duty here in the bridge is to keep the safety of the navigation, the safety of the crew, and the safety of the ship. So basically, we're here in control of the propulsion and the navigation of the vessel. In our case, making sure that we're monitoring the area, uh, that we don't have any fire, that everything is under control. We're following up the CTA and making sure that uh, we're following our path and make it uh, also like the radar is our, our most amazing uh, device because it's going to allow us to detect any panga for uh, nautic miles away. And also we are drones. We're making sure that we have the evidences of the pangas that are nearby or inside the CTA. But basically, we just take the command from here. We are able to monitor the area and making sure that there is no illegal fishing inside the CTA. And one of the things that I know you partner with very directly with the, uh, the Mexican Navy is on removing nets. So could you tell us a little bit about how do how does the seahorse detect these nets and, and how do you and your crew and the Navy work together to remove those deadly nets from the upper Gulf of California so that they don't kill the vaquita and they don't kill the totoaba? Yeah, so we have 193 concrete blocks that were installed inside the CTA which with our sonar, high technology sonar, we are able to detect them and also to detect if they have any gas net wrapped into them. So we're monitoring, we're scanning every day, the 24 hours, the concrete plus, making sure to try to find any gas net that is lost over there. Once we spot one of them, in collaboration, Sea Shepherd and the Mexican Navy, all together in the Navy interceptors with our crew and their crew, uh, we're making an operation for starting the retrieval of that gas net. The thing here is that our sonar allows us to see uh, what is the size of the net, where is the location, and different views as well. So the seahorse monitoring the area and also scanning, we are avoiding for having any illegal fishing inside the CTA, and also the gas nets that get trapped in the concrete blocks, we are taking them out. So yeah, that's more or less what we're doing. Understood. And um, and uh, Captain Cass, I know you have to go back and actually uh, resume your responsibilities as captain. So feel free to, uh, to and thank you so much for joining us. Um, here's a little footage right now. Um, captain Alejandro, I believe you you pulled a particularly large net just earlier this week, right? It was over a kilometer long or something. Yeah. Yeah. So like we took out two nets in our boat this week, last week. But uh, there was what that we, we reported that was a pang out uh, in the city, outside the CTA. But this was this was a net that doesn't have an owner. This was just floating in the water. So we called the Navy, and they arrived very quick, actually, kind of five minutes, six minutes thing, and they started to retrieve the net. And this was kind of a a kilometer net, which was amazing because they retrieved this net, which was just resting in the water, and also. Uh, we detected two gosnets in concrete blocks, so we uh, managed, we arranged operation with the Navy, and we started to, the, the retrieval operations were successful, actually. So we could say that a lot between last week and this one, we took out three nets from the water. Got it. It's super interesting. And I, I think we're going to head down to the galley now, so maybe we could start to do that. But while we do that, I'll just share. When Captain Alejandro talks about ghost nets and things like that, these are nets that have been discarded by um, uh, fishermen uh, that uh, can stay in the water for weeks, months, years, uh, and continue to entrap animals. And a lot of what we've seen uh, in terms of the devastation of, of these endangered species in the upper Gulf of California is very often because of these illegal nets that have just been left behind. Um, uh, and they continue to ensnare and they continue to kill. And what you can see here is when we pull these nets up onto our deck uh, in partnership with the Mexican Navy, we then have a small window where often we can go through and actually liberate some of these um, animals while they're still alive. Um, we have a really interesting program about, about liberating ensnared sea lions that we're going to go to next. But what you're, what you're looking at right now is all of our crews, not only our scientists, but everyone jumped in there 
uh, once we have that net up on deck and, and they all work together with the Mexican Navy to free animals that have been that have been uh, trapped in these nets. And, and very often we're lucky and we get them or at least some of them while they're still alive. Um, but very often, unfortunately, we come across situations where another animal has been killed by uh, a net that's just been left behind. So not only do we have to worry about the illegal activity, but we also are out there on the on the on the ocean in the upper Gulf patrolling uh, for discarded gear. We're going to go now uh, if we have the galley. Um, uh, another interesting thing about, oh, please, please, Octavia. Yeah, and I, I just want to add that that Columba net, we were able to find uh, rays that were still alive. And we got to the net early enough, thanks to the sonar and thanks to the captain said, using our, our very sophisticated sonar to find the net. And we were able to get there in time in order to, uh, to save a lot of rays. So I think it's important to note that that our technology allows us to, to see these things before they become death traps for the vaquita and the tatuaba, you know? So I think it's very, very important to, to realize that the, the ship being there 24 hours a day helps to find anything that's out there that can endanger the life of the tatuaba and the vaquita. And thanks to our courageous crews, uh, they're able to be there 24 hours a day and uh and save rays just like we did this last week fantastic we go back now live to the seahorse down into the galley um hello. so welcome maybe you could just say uh, introduce yourself and say hello to our viewers that are tuning in from all around the world hello my name's holly i'm from the uk and yeah i've been in the galley now for almost six weeks working on the seahorse the crew here and maybe you could tell us a, a little bit about about the the, the the vegan diet on board, and maybe maybe tell us one or two of, of the specialties that people always ask you to, to make. Yeah, um, well, a lot of people come here and they're not vegan, and I think some people find that a little bit challenging. They have like a meat heavy diet at home, um, but in general, I think people are quite happy with the food. I try and vary it as much as possible. Things like pasta is always really popular with everyone. Like lasagna goes down really well. Um, I'm trying to make a lot more Mexican food because we have like a largely Mexican crew. At the moment, I'm cooking, so we have a suggestion board here. You see fake egg is top of the list. I think this is written in a permanent <laughs> marker. I can't get rid of that. Um, and lentijas y salsicha. That is um, one of the security guards uh, requested that. So that's what I'm making this evening. It's really simple. It's just, it's just some vegan sausages and lentils and a tomato sauce, actually. Um, it's his own recipe, so I'm following it to the books. Um, but yeah, what do we have for lunch? We did a leftover lunch today, tried to make a lot of food, so there's enough in the fridge. Um, what else do I make regularly? Yeah, I don't know. Lots of soups. I like soups. I don't know if everyone else does. <laughs> That's beautiful. And and maybe just briefly, how how did you, were, were you a chef and then you heard about Sea Shepherd or how do you end up being a, a chef on, on, on board uh, the seahorse? Um, I've known a Sea Shepherd for a long time. I don't know how long, and it's 10 years or so. And then I was working in restaurants while at uni and I finished uni and I just applied and I thought I could, I could use this skill set basically. I have, I'm hoping this is the last chefing that I do. <laughs> the last for us. Excellent. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Excellent. And let me also share that uh, people can go to seashepherd.org and support the work that we've yeah. been talking about and uh, and support uh, the our, our vegan uh, crew, which is you can actually get mm -hmm. the Sea Shepherd vegan cookbook. Um, my wife got it for me for uh, Christmas uh, a year ago, and we've made some recipes out of it and things like that. Um, thank you so much for, for your service on the ship, for uh, for feeding everyone and uh, for doing it in a way that's uh, plant-based and, and friendly to the planet. So we very much appreciate you being on board and thank you so much for spending a few minutes with, with us here on the Shepherd Show. And, no and problem, Roger, thank I you. Can attest, I can attest to, please, I can attest to Holly's, I, I can attest to your Oh good yeah, you tried my chili. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, no, it was, it was fantastic. No I visited the ship maybe a couple of weeks ago and I was able to taste your cooking and, and, and fantastic food and, and, and book is always kind of the heart of the show. So thank you so much for being there. No problem. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, thank you. We're going to go live now to the uh, the Mexico Marine Wildlife Rescue Center. We're going to be having a quick conversation with Victoria. Um, some of you may have seen in our in our monthly newsletters that towards the end of last year we began a the very first steps of a, of a, of a new program in the upper Gulf of California, where we in, uh, help ensnared sea lions and, and, um, and liberate them from discarded fishing gear. Um, we were at the very first steps of this, um, but Victoria runs this wonderful center. We're really learning from her and her colleagues. So first off, Victoria, thank you so much for joining the debut Sea Shepherd Show for 2024. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, Wildlife Rescue Center and uh, some of the work you've been doing with my colleagues uh, in Sea Shepherd. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me, Roger. So we are more than just a rescue center. We're a rescue organization. So our goal is to rescue and rehabilitate any kind of stranded marine wildlife or respond to every stranding in general that could be live or dead animals. Um, this includes cetaceans, pinnipeds, sea turtles, and even other large marine megafauna like whale sharks or rays. Um, we have a physical location for the rehabilitation of what we would consider critical cases. So if it's an animal that we're able to manage and bring back to our center for acute treatment or care and then ongoing uh, rehabilitative care, we do that. We do this always, like 100% of the time with the intention of reintroducing that animal to the wild. So that's the most important part. Um, we did get to do some work with you guys. Disentanglements are unfortunately a really big part of what we do at MMWRC. I would say, I don't have the exact stats at the moment, but I would say probably 60% of our cases are around thereabouts are entanglements. So this can be entanglements in discarded fishing gear like we talked about, in recreational fishing gear, commercial fishing gear. It can also be entanglements in plastic debris and other rubbish that finds its way into the oceans. Um, you guys were a great help to us on one of our last campaigns. We were able to bring the sea lions that we had sedated up on board and use the ship as our platform to do our disentanglement work. So that was really fantastic. And it was fun to have you guys in the mix and getting to see what we do firsthand. So tell, share a little bit with our viewers and, th and thank you for that. That was like a, a perfect kind of uh, grounding in, in who you all are and, and what you do. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Did you start off loving the oceans and then you got into animal care? Did you start off animal care and then you got into the oceans or was it all just the same journey or how do, how do you arrive at this work? <laughs> well, that would be a really long story, Roger, and this show's not about me, but um, yeah, I've loved, I've loved marine animals since I was a kid. So I moved from Scotland where I was born and my family's from to Hawaii at the age of five. And I got to see my first shark that year in person, like up close and in person. It was dead on a beach, but I was fascinated. And then I also got to see whales regularly and it blew my mind. And now I've been fortunate enough to say that every year of my life since then, I've been able to see these types of animals, right? Many times per year. I never get over it. I was just telling your crew the other day that it doesn't matter how many times I see a whale, I'm still gonna go woohoo when I'm on the boat. It doesn't matter. I could see one every single day of the year and I'm still gonna be thrilled. So. Yeah, throughout my career, I've, I've ended up here. I am a marine biologist. Um, I've worked in husbandry in the past for marine animals. Uh, I worked in aquatic filtration as well. So I'm a bit of an expert on how to keep animals alive in water. And so those two things kind of went together for something like this. Only a small percentage of our cases come here, maybe about 12%. But when they're here, we want to give them the absolute best care possible and make sure that we can get them home to the wild. And, and, and uh, obviously this is just scratching the surface of, of, of who you all are and what, what you do. How can some of our viewers get some more information about you and where can they find you on socials and things like that? Absolutely. So we can post our socials, but we're at Mexico underscore MWRC on Instagram, and that can link you right to our Facebook. You can also visit our website, which is just w sorry MMWRC.org. It's a very long name, but we wanted it to encompass not only who we are and what we do, but where we are, because it's really important to note that we're a Mexican organization. I'm the only non-Mexican involved with it, and my partner and I are the two that run this organization. Understood. And I believe you're going to maybe walk us around just a little bit, right? So um, do you sure. want to take our viewers on a little bit of a stroll through your facility there? Yeah. So we're just outside our holding area. So it's a little bit dark at the moment. So I'm standing in front of one of our enclosures here. And I don't know if you can see, but... It's bare bones at the moment. In here, I have a very, very young sea lion pup, just five or six months old. There's no, no pool in here at the moment for her. She's really, really skinny. She's five or six months 
months old, but only weighs about what she would weigh at the time of birth. So we're keeping her warm and cozy inside of a kennel for the night and monitoring her. So she's getting fed here. We hope to let her go in, I don't know, the next four to eight weeks, I would imagine. We'll get enough weight put on her with a good diet and some medication to treat her. Uh, if we walk down this way, we just have three holding enclosures outside in this area. If we walk down this way, we were just in the middle of uh, cleaning a pool for one of our sea turtles. So we have her in a temporary holding pool for the moment. Can you see her behind me? Yeah. So she's got mm -hmm. a towel on her back just to keep her nice and wet for the time being until we move her back over to her pool. Um, but this is a sea turtle. Um, she had three flippers when she came to us, but that's not the reason she came here. She was doing just fine on her own. Uh, she came here because she was really thin and really sick. So she's been receiving courses of antibiotics and a continually um, like monitored diet to make sure that she's doing well. And she's getting ready to go back into her ocean home very soon as well. And what's, what's your sense of what she was suffering from? Are you able to, to um, detect uh, how she ended up um, so sick that she ended up in your facility? Yeah, so um, when they found the animal, it wasn't us who actually brought her in. It was the authorities that brought her to us. Uh, she was brought in because she wasn't behaving normally in the wild. And after some contact with the animal, they realized that she was too lethargic and out of it. I'm simplifying that. But there were signs that she was sick, right? So what we do here is we do always an intake examination first and have every animal here for a minimum of 48 hours to assess what's going on with them. And that includes blood work so that we can get pathology and histology on these animals and see if we can find out the root of their problem. Sometimes it's really obvious. It's a physical trauma, it's something external, or it's damage from an entanglement or something like that. But in her case, it's something that we couldn't just see with the naked eye. So we have to do this analysis to find out what's going on. So she had an infection. I'll just keep it simple like that. So she had an infection and we were able to treat that with antibiotics. Understood. Well, thank you so much for helping that sea line and thank you for the time that you've spent um, with our colleagues and we look forward to working shoulder and shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with you and, and your colleagues and uh, disentangling sea lines and learning the other ways that we can work together to reduce the suffering uh, out there in the ocean. So thank you. We're gonna, Victoria, thanks. thank you very much. Um, thanks, Roger. We're gonna go back to the uh, sea line to just sign off with Captain Alejandro and then I'm gonna hand it over to Octavio here for just a, um, an update uh, on our newest uh, ship and our newest responsibility, but it looks like we're getting kind of a team picture down here. How's everyone doing? Very good. Hello. That, that's our crew mess on the on the seahorse. Everybody can see that. H how are you guys doing? Very good. How about good, you? Good. Hello, yeah, everyone. Great, great job pulling those pulling those nets and getting those animals out. Thank you very much. We, we saw we, we saw the video. Yeah, and. Uh, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm, you know, again, this wouldn't be possible with our, our, our very, very dedicated crews like yourselves being on the ocean, you know, putting yourself in harm's way to be able to save animals. Uh, and and I just, you know, as, as director of ship operations, obviously I deal with a lot of you guys and uh, I come from the ships. So I, I miss being aboard, uh, but you know, uh, right now I have different responsibilities, and one of those is bringing new ships to the uh, to the fleet. And I'm very excited to announce the Seahawk, which is a boat that we're going to be using in collaboration with the Navy. And uh, th this this boat is essentially a fast boat because we're going to be protecting not only the Vaquita but also the Tatuaba. We're very deep into the Tatuaba season, as you guys know, and uh, it's very important that we protect. Not just the not just the Bikita, not just the Tatuaba, but all sea life that is entangled in these nets, these death traps that are left on the ocean floor, and uh, and it seems to me that that, uh, that that we're starting to get right into Tatuaba season. So that's why the Martin Sheen and thank you, Captain Cass, for giving us a a, a brief update from the Martin Sheen. So you guys on the seahorse should have a. Uh, two ships coming your way, you know, and so it, it, it'll be very exciting awesome. to have. Awesome. Yes, so it, it, it's it's awesome, and, and you know, we 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 have great teams, and we're, I'm going to hand it back over here to Roger. So thank you so much. Hey, maybe just for the sake of our viewers, could we um, just have everyone introduce maybe themselves by their first name and and what their job is? 
Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for your viewers and supporters. Uh, I'm Vinicius, I'm from Brazil, and I'm the first mate of the Seahorse. Hello, I'm Abel, I'm the second officer, and I'm from Mexico. Hey everyone, I'm Martí, I'm from Spain, and I'm a biologist here in the Seahorse. Hi, hello, I'm Isabel, um, I'm an engineer. Right now I'm doing land crew coordinator, but taking some time on the seahorse to to do new uh, logistics with the, this new boat and Martin Green and all this arrangement. And hello, I'm Kate, I'm a deckhand and I'm from Sweden. Beautiful. Well, thank you all for being there. We're going to move to the final part of our program now, which is to talk a little bit about what just happened today. So thank you so much, Seahorse crew. Uh, thank you for what you do. Be safe out there. And here's the biggest news. Um, just today, uh, Octavio and I, our CEO, Pritam Singh, and some other members of, of the team were over at the Mexican Navy headquarters to sign uh, an agreement about a brand new campaign. So we will be going to the Gulf of Ulloa, which is uh, on the Pacific side of Baja, California, to uh, help and work with the Mexican Navy to um, protect what's called the careta careta turtle, or in, in, in uh, the United States would be called the, the uh, leatherback turtle. It uh, has one of the largest migratory patterns of uh, any um, marine um, uh, animal. It, it's actually born in Japan and comes all the way across the Pacific and it nests uh, in and around the Gulf of Uyoa. And what we've seen in the last um, couple of years is uh, a significant uh, amount of um, mortality by way of the illegal use of uh, fishing gear. We are just at the beginning of this campaign. What's really ahead of us right now is probably a 90 day period where we're gonna be doing an intense logistical analysis of what the, what the um, protection protocols are gonna look like, the reporting structure, what kind of ships are gonna be required for us to be successful there in protecting these turtles. But it's a brand new campaign. The ink is literally still wet on it because it was just signed this afternoon. That's Secretary Admiral Ojeda uh, of the Mexican Navy and our CEO, Pritam Singh, signing that agreement this afternoon. We'll have a lot more information in, in, a, in a couple months. This, this campaign is going to kick in uh, mid-2024 uh, in terms of actual ships on the water and, and, and uh, helping to protect uh, these turtles. And I want to come back around to where we started. This is an organization about optimism. It's really easy to get down on all the news about the environmental challenges around the world. But what we do every day, we're doing it today, as you just saw, you heard from Captain Alejandro, you heard from Captain Cass, you saw the crew, we're doing it next week, next month, next year, is putting our ships out there on the line, um, getting between poachers and cartels and illegal fishing gear and some of the most endangered species on earth. That is who we are, that is what we do. We're an optimistic crew out there trying to protect some of these animals, and we can only do it with your support. We are a donation-driven organization. We take no money from any government anywhere, period, full stop. Our clients are the whales, the sea turtles, the vaquita, the porpoise. Every single campaign that we do is focused on putting our ships and our crews right on the line between extinction and survival for some of the most endangered marine wildlife on the planet. So thank you so much for joining us. We have a couple questions coming in um, and maybe I could turn this over to you, Octavio. Uh, so how many, you've been with us for, for so long, um, it's over a thousand nets pulled in just Operation Milagro, correct? Correct, uh, Operation Milagro, we pulled over a thousand nets and, and at one point I, I, I calculated that it was um, it was equivalent from, from um, from going for, if you if you were to extend it, going from um, Washington D.C. All, all the way to, to well, I, I don't go to the moon and back or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I remember you had some kind of rip. anyway. It was it was it was hundreds of miles of nets that we found uh, it, that was that was basically left on the ocean floor. Uh, to snare anything that was going to be uh, passing by, including the vaquita, and that is that is the reason for the demise of the of the vaquita originally. But uh, during those years, we were able to find those thousand nets, get them out of the water, 
And, uh, and now we're in the best situation that we've ever been in because we have such a strong collaboration with the Navy and the Navy is out there helping us and, uh, and pulling nets. So instead of having a thousand nets to pull that right now on a daily basis, we have almost zero nets to pull. We find some nets that are, that, that are caught in the concrete blocks. And, and like I said, last week we found one net, but for the most part, and you can go on our website and you can see the statistics because we have two scientists on board full time working 24 hours a day. And you can see the statistics for yourself that uh, there are zero nets in the ZTA, which is the zero tolerance area. Where, and that is exactly where the scientists told us that the remaining vaquitas are living. And as a result of last year's uh, uh, vaquita survey, uh, we saw uh, uh, babies. So they are... For the first time, the population is not going down. Calves, calves mean hope. That's what we're saying. Um, we uh, really appreciate you joining our, our debut show for 2024. Thank you so much for joining the Sea Shepherd Show. Thank you, Captain Cass. Uh, thank you, Captain Alejandro. Thank you to everyone who uh, has contributed and, and is um, supporting us. Um, we are so proud to be able to do this work and to be able to go out there with our ships and our captains and our crews and fight for endangered marine wildlife and some of the most fragile ecosystems on earth. So that's the end of our show. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. There's going to be more shows coming up. We have a lot more updates, a lot more species to protect. So stay tuned. We got more work ahead and we'll be back for the second show of 2024 uh, in the month of February.